and how do you stay tuned to the rapid changes? Basically, you're living in a non-stationary world. And in both of those cases, the only way I know how to deal with it is that you are really, really paying close attention to the data and asking, okay, why did this change happen? Can we figure out what led to this change? And if you have the sufficient data at the right resolution, you just might be able to piece it together. But not always. For example, in that case of, of Netflix with the seven, well, that seven may be only true for a certain percentage of the population. Once all the heavy adopters are, or the new adopters are finished, you've gone through all of them, maybe the next wave needs 13. Maybe in Latin America, it only needs four. So how do you optimize for those flows? That's through just regular testing and regular, regular uh, follow-up. And it's, there's no great one universal answer, unfortunately. With the Netflix example, it's also can be the case that you're like change of your behavior, and you're pushing that number, actually change the number itself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think there's that classic, because you changed it, you impacted the way it happened. And you, you, you may have had an unintended impact uh, yeah, just by doing things. Movie. Oh, the number of times, and maybe this is what you were getting, getting at in the previous question, was the number of times where I've seen somebody roll out something and it had the opposite impact or some totally unintended consequence is very, very high. Very high. And you realize, you're like, wow, we would have never guessed the users would have acted that way. Or people, you know, people would have responded this way to things. It's like, you know, we changed, we changed the button to blue. Well, that shade of blue everyone hates, <laughs> right? Or people, wow, it really resonates for that period of time. Yeah, that, and that's a super really simplistic one, but the structure of the page, the rollout of the page, all these things, massive. Can I ask a question about AA testing a little bit? Uh, so that would be most applicable when you have stratified testing, right? So you're trying to isolate a particular group of particular sample, and mm -hmm. if you're trying to make sure, that before you start doing the A-B testing on that sample, you're trying to make sure that the sample is correct. Am I right? You, you want to make sure that you have a consistent or a set of population, and that if your AA test shows that you have variations, you haven't sampled correctly. Could you be very specific? Yeah. So for example, suppose you have, you're taking 10% of your population, you want to run them through some tests. Right. But, in the, in the, but you're going to take that 10% and split it into 5 and 5. And then you're going to look at the metric that says, how many uh, clicks did we get on this? Mm -hmm. Well, there shouldn't be any difference between those two buckets. But let's suppose there's a 5% or an 8% differential between those two it's buckets. Then, then something is flawed. So it's a, it's a way of making sure that everything is, is right uh, for the segmentation. You Otherwise, you're in some type of weird, weird segmentation or non-stationary process. Yes? Uh, I work in a social game developer company as a chief data scientist. And part of the work. You didn't know. raise your hand when I asked who was a data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as part of my work, uh, we have created uh, an external software as a service uh, product to collect all, collect all the data from all the games, uh, just in order not to stress the back end service of the game. Uh, and that uh, Led to a convenient service to calculate all the metrics, uh, customer time values, churns, performance analysis, uh, and a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, but we never wrote it out to uh, other companies. How do you think? Yeah, can there be a large market of such services for, say, small and medium business uh, internet consumer companies? Mm. So I think that's a first a, a brilliant form of creating the architecture. A few years ago, no one would even dare do those type of things. Uh, or even think that, hey, look, let's aggregate that data. So kudos for doing that. The second thing I would say is, uh, why do you think that you couldn't roll this out as a service? What stopped you from doing that? Uh, just say we did, uh, for our games, it was about uh, five to six games when I worked there. Yeah. Um, our core business was to do the games to earn from virtual goods sales, etc. Uh, and we just didn't have the time. When, when, I left, when I left the company, I just uh, was thinking about, wait, how about starting something like that? Because I, we had created architecture 
uh, we need to figure out how the way to collect all the data and control it. So yeah. to clean all the unnecessary data after calculating all the metrics. Right? Data arbitrage. So the data, a type of form of data arbitrage. Mm -hmm. So here's, I think it's it's interesting because for a couple reasons. So the first is when when I, when we were setting up the, the LinkedIn data team, one of the things I did is I went to all the major internet companies and I asked what were the biggest frustrations with the different models. And there was one common thing that I heard over and over again from everyone. And it was the data guys came up with great ideas like this. And they'd come and say, hey, we should do this. And everyone said, yeah, 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 not now. Not now. Not on our roadmap. Anybody have that problem? I have an idea, and then we're rolling. <laughs> exactly, right? It's like everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was about you know, three hours ago. <laughs> and so one of the things that we did is we actually structured the data team as a full product team. So at LinkedIn, it has web dev, it has designers, it has product managers, it has a full engineering team. It is in control of its destiny. Because otherwise, as a company, you don't understand how to actually make the product real. Because a lot of times, like people even know, there's an idea that people, not just LinkedIn, a lot of people around the industry are like, yeah, that's silly. So how do you suddenly take and challenge that? Sometimes the only way is to go do it. And you have to have an organizational model where it says, yep, yeah, we have flexibility to do it or try it. Now, doing it as an external service is also an interesting challenge. There are people that are now really starting to build businesses on it. And if you can get the relationships between all of those partners to share the data, to create a good value add overall, then you've got a winner. And that's the big challenge, getting people to share that data. Yeah. Yes? Uh, how is data science connected with data mining? Uh, I think data mining, so data science, I would say, is, is so data mining is definitely, at the very minimum, an academic discipline, right? There's, there's formal courses, there's everything you can take, you can get trained in it. And so there's a lot of algorithms, a lot of uh, other stuff in there. It's also an application of engineering. And how do you implement? How do you do the development? How do you implement those things? And I think there was, what, it, what we're saying is data science is, it leverages data, data mining. There are certainly data scientists who leverage data mining, but it, it's not the only space that you can use it for. The insights, the business intelligence, the finance, all those other elements can also be incorporated in data science. So I see it as heavily overlapping in certain aspects, but also a broader thing. I mean, the way we termed data science was, so the, the way we came up with the title was a joint, jointly between Jeff Hammerbacher and myself at, at Facebook and LinkedIn, and we didn't know what to name our teams. And so we sat down for lunch one day and we said, what are you going to name your guys? He said, well, we could call them analysts. I said, well, that sounds like they're in finance. He said, well, we would call them uh, researchers. Said, well, that doesn't sound right either. How about research scientists? No, that really doesn't sound right because we're trying to build stuff and get it out there and make it live. So then we said, well, analytics? Well, that didn't quite sound just right. So it sounded like the team name. So then we said, well, they're data, and we're all from the scientist background. What would we call it data science? All right, that seems to make sense. We'll call them data scientists. That's how data scientists came about. Now, I'm convinced, actually, there's somebody in the 70s that, from IBM that called themselves a data scientist, but we've been asking, but no one's come forward. But that was, and this was only three years ago. This was a little over three years ago that this, this conversation happened. And since then, the field has just exploded. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your practice, have you ever received uh, some real benefit from any sophisticated data mining algorithms such as regression trees and neural networks? Or something like that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, boy, all the time. Uh, you know, I think that, the, but the, the number one thing that happens in there is, I think when people are building the systems, they highly try to go try to figure out what the algorithm is, and that's actually not what's most important. What's most important is being able to take the data and break it up into variables. Mm -hmm. So the more variables you have are the critical. Where the model happens, like different models may give you lift of like 0.01%, not a whole lot. But the real benefit of the models is that uh, it, how fast is the refresh? How fast does it update? How well is it, is, it, is it staying track of the real data as it changes? 
all those aspects. Yeah. Yes? What is the difference between uh, product and energy steam when they are trying to create new product? I don't know if there's a difference. I think it can be all the same. It's just how you, how you carve up your time and how you decide what to spend your focus and your prioritization on. I mean, when LinkedIn Analytics started, it, I mean, it started with zero guys, and it was one guy, and then it was two guys, and then when I came on board, it was one and a half engineer and only five uh, analysts. Um, so it was small. And then now it's, now it's really big. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'll, I'll end there, uh, but I'll stick around if there's uh, any questions that, that people have. So thank you. Thank you.